Hello everybody, Alex also known as Solanus Dracon here, and welcome back to my Pern Primer series part 5. So, this begins the part of the Primer series in which I talk about the structure of Pern, how it is set up, and how things generally work. The Dragon Riders of Pern books get a lot into politics, but they're politics specific to the world itself. There is a tangible and comprehensive system of how the people on Pern interact with each other, who has authority to do what, and comprehensive leadership systems. To me, this is the strongest aspect of the book series, world building. Everything is set up beautifully so that you can imagine yourself in that world. So let's get started. There are three political powers on Pern. There are the Holds, the Halls, and the Weirs. Today's topic is the Holds. A hold is essentially a place where people live. By necessity, they are almost always founded wherever there is an available cave system to build into. There are major and minor holds, and this leads into the sort of feudal system which exists upon Pern. The head of the house in any hold is called a holder. If you are a holder of a minor hold, then that's all you are, a holder. If, however, you are the holder of a major hold, then you are a lord holder. While it is not a hard and fast rule, generally a holder's family, whether major or minor, will inherit that hold when the previous holder either retires or passes away. Because of this, it is the duty of any holder to train up their chosen successor in hold management. Unfortunately, Pern has become somewhat of a patriarchy by the Ninth Pass, though it is not completely unheard of for a woman to be a holder. When that is the case, they are generally called a lady holder. The major holds are given governance over the minor holds in their respective areas. Holders pay taxes in the form of tithes, or shares of their product, to the Lord Holder, who then distributes it fairly to the governance of the entire holding, either through providing aid to minor holders who have had a bad harvest, or in trade with other holds or craft halls. The Lord Holder has the authority to eject someone from a hold for any reason of their choosing, you would naturally think that this could easily lead to a despotic regime, and in fact it sometimes does, but there are systems in place for dealing with that. The most common reason that a lord holder would eject a regular holder from their land is if the holder is clearly incapable of cultivating and keeping that land. Despite everything one may say or do, the entire population of Pern remains in danger of thread. If a plot of land is not being used to help maintain the population, and it's the fault of some fool who doesn't know what he's doing, you've got to get that fool out of there so someone competent can make it work. Land is, as it always has been throughout any and all of history, essential to survival. A Lord Holder also has the authority to impose certain rules upon their Minor Holders. For instance, they can insist that minor holders keep the immediate area around their holds completely free of any greenery. As Thread seeks out greenery and life in order to feed, this is considered a security precaution. This can also swing into a despotic direction, wherein unfair tithes can be levied or teachers are unallowed to teach certain subjects. But again, systems are in place for dealing with it when a lord holder goes rogue. Since the entire population of Pern had moved to the northern continent, there have been 15 major holds established. They are the big population centers of Pern. In no particular order, they are Fort, Ruatha, Southern Bull, Benden, Bitra, Lemos, High Reaches, Nabol, Tillich, Karun, Ista, Igen, Narat, Telgar, and Krom. Each of these holds are autonomous in their dealings, and no amount of seniority of founding grants any one of the major holds any authority over any of the others. They do, however, fall under the authority of the Weirs to some degree, due to the Dragon Riders being the primary protection against Thread, though I'll get into much greater detail about that in a separate Primer video. Suffice it to say for now, each hold is under the protective jurisdiction of one of the six Weirs. Holds are also the locations where the various craft halls are located, but again, the details of that will come in another video. Fort was the first hold founded in the north, and it is also the largest. It falls under the jurisdiction of Fort Weir, also the oldest weir on Pern. It is the location of the Harper Hall and the Healer Hall. 
It is sort of a general hold in that it has access to fishing, farming, and other such basic amenities as are needed. Remember, as the first hold, it had to be able to support an entire population completely, so it had to be located where it could count upon all the necessary resources. Most of the holds which were founded afterward were done during intervals, when the absence of thread meant that free travel was much safer. These holds could afford to specialize a bit more and make up for their lack of certain supplies by trading with other holds. Ruatha Hold is next, often called the Second Hold, though that isn't strictly true. It's what the people of the Ninth Pass believed, because of the garbling of information over the centuries. It is a somewhat smaller hold, but is best known for two things, the quality of its horses and the propensity to produce an unusually large number of dragon riders. Ruatha Hold's bloodline is renowned for having people with certain psychic capabilities, though again, the centuries have changed the understanding of the populace to suggest that they're all just a little bit special. As dragons tend to be attracted to people with a bit of psychic capability, it's small wonder that Ruatha produces a lot of dragon riders. They too are under the jurisdiction of Fort Weir. Southern Bull is next, and while it was in fact the actual second hold founded, it is generally thought of as the third. My best explanation for this is that despite Southern Bull being sort of the second place where people actually began to move to thin out the numbers at Fort, they didn't declare themselves as a hold until after Ruatha was founded. This isn't honestly backed up by any evidence in the literature, but it's my own interpretation based upon the assumption that the Pernese hadn't quite yet worked out the entire hold system until after Ruatha declared itself. It's not known exactly what their specialization is, but I again assume that because it was originally set up as a place for people to move to in order to get away from Fort, it's probably another jack-of-all-trades hold, with perhaps a bit more fishing as it has more coastline. It is the location of the Weaver Craft Hall, and is under Fort Weir's jurisdiction. Next, we have Bendenhold. Located across the continent from Fort, they have a bit more of a hilly forest vibe. It is another hold which could be considered to be all-purpose, having access to sufficient natural resources to sustain itself, and it is the location of the Vintner Hall, where the best wines on Pern are made, and is under the jurisdiction of Bendenweir. Bitra Hold is a more mountainous and slightly cold area. Bitra is regarded largely as a shady hold and has a worldwide reputation for gambling and its people being somewhat untrustworthy in their dealings. It is under the jurisdiction of Bendenweir and has no craft hall located there, unless you count gambling as a craft. Lemos Hold also exists, is mountainous, and has a somewhat shady reputation. Nowhere near as shady as Bitra, but still kind of shady. No craft holds, Bend and Weir's jurisdiction. Not all of the holds are remarkable, so I don't have much to say about this one. High Reach's hold is the most mountainous of holds, and exists upon Pern's far northwest. It is known for being highly mountainous and very cold. It has a slight reputation for having cranky people. There are no craft holds located here, and they are under the protection of High Reach's Weir. Nabal Hold, another one with a somewhat shady reputation, Perhaps a bit more shady than Lemos, but not as shady as Bitra. It too is under the protection of High Reach's Weir, and has no craft holes. Tilek Hold, the furthest west of the holds, is predominantly fishing based, which is appropriate because it is the location of the Fisher Craft Hole. They are also wine producers, though most Pernies regard Tilek wine to be of inferior quality to Benden. It is protected by High Reach's Weir. Karun Hold is a plains type of area, having the largest amount of prairie land, which is good because they are the location of the Beastcraft Hall. They too are known for horses, though not of the same quality as Ruatha. They are looked over by Igin Weir. Ista is an island hold, and so their economy is largely fishing based. Because the climate is generally warm and not too humid, a lot of people retire to Ista Hold when they get older, kind of like Florida. They are the location of the Glasssmith Hall and are protected by Ista Weir. Igin Hold is in the desert, so I don't know exactly what their main product is. They probably just looked after themselves as best they can and import things they need from other holds. They are the location of the Tanner Craft Hall, which is the craft of making leather. They are protected by Igin Weir. 
Neratholt is on the eastern peninsula and is a very dense, lush, jungle-type region. Many fruits and exotic herbs are grown there. Most likely for this reason, they are the location of the Farmer Craft Hall. They are protected by Egin Weir. Telgar is the northernmost of the holds and sits in a fairly large grasslands kind of area, but with a lot of mountains. It was the original mining center of Pern, but when its resources began to run dry, the mining moved elsewhere. It is the location of the Smith Craft Hall and is protected by Telgar Weir. Finally, Krom, a mountainous hold. They are most well known for their mining resources, so they are where the majority of mining on Pern moved to from Telgar Hold, so it is the location of the Minor Craft Hall, and it is protected by Telgar Weir. So those are the 15 major holds. Once a year, the Lord Holders will meet in a conclave to discuss things of importance to the entirety of Pern. Large sweeping policies are decided here, and this is the system I spoke of where bad Lord Holders are held to task. While each of the holds are autonomous, the Lord Holders do have to answer to the rest of the population of Pern if they're being terrible to their own people. Human rights are, to some degree or another, held dear to the people of Pern. If enough complaints and evidence are brought against a Lord Holder, that they are abusing their power or are excessively negligent, it is within the Conclave's authority to strip the Lord Holder of their title. Lord Holders have a duty to their minor holders to see to it that they are provided with what they need to be self-sufficient and are properly protected from thread, as well as take any measures possible to protect the population in the event of an outbreak of disease. While the Conclave may be the primary place where weighty matters are discussed, if a crime or situation is deemed serious enough, then representatives from all the three powers may be called together to make a snap decision at any time. This is usually done either during a time of emergency or when a crime has been committed by a world leader which is so serious that it merits immediate action. There is no death penalty on Pern, there is only exile. Most of the time, if a person is exiled, it is to the eastern islands off the coast of the northern continent. There, exiles will not receive any protection from Thread by Dragon Riders and are generally left to their fates. They are provided with sufficient supplies to survive for a bit, and then when that runs out, they can either find a way to survive on their own, or they can die. Because exile is meant to be permanent, with no chance of rescue, the condemned criminal is taken to their spot by a dragon rider on a trip between, and from then on, only that dragon rider who took them knows where they have been left, unless they tell someone else. Generally, only the most trustworthy and highly respected dragon riders will be asked to perform this duty. For lesser crimes committed by less important people, a person can be shunned from their hold. If the crime is serious enough, e.g. murder, then the word will spread around to all the other holds not to let this person in. So a person and any family who goes with them will be considered holdless, which is just as bad as homeless. As stated, the duty of a Lord Holder is to make sure that their lands are productive and viable, that their people are reasonably safe and well tended to, and are given authority and autonomy to achieve that duty in whatever way they see fit, as long as it's not inhumane. Since regular holders make up the vast majority of the population of Pern, they are considered to be the average normal people on Pern. Every holder works their own land, runs their own family, and pays their own tithes. And that concludes today's episode. Next week, I will talk about the craft halls. Thank you all for watching. Once again, I am Alex, also known as Solanus Dracone, and this has been episode 5 of my Pern Primer series. Goodbye.